Okay, so today uh, we've got Paul who's going to be talking about intermediate R concepts, such as uh, loops and functions and if-else statements. Um, and I guess, Paul, do you want to just uh, jump in and introduce yourself and get started? Sure, Henry. So I'm Paul, and I'm a PhD student in the Best Ross Lab. And most of my work is working on RNA-seq of Alzheimer's samples, along with um, a lot of transposable element work, so jumping genes. And lately, I've been looking more into um, more DNA sequencing and looking at structural variants of different um, genes. So we're going to start off by sharing my screen. So you all can see that. So let me just, um, OK, now I'm presenting mode. So welcome to week two of the bioinformatics bootcamp, where we're going to go over conditional logic and control flow. So to get started, the topics for today, and um, we're pretty much going in sync with um, data camp if any of you were able to complete the R intermediate module. So we're gonna be going over loops, functions, and the apply family of functions today. And to start off, um, why should you use and learn flow controls? Well, there is a lot of answers to that. It adds efficiency to your code. Um, it become, your code becomes a lot easier to read and you are able to take up less space. So instead of writing a bunch of lines for like, that takes up like a bunch of code that takes up 10 lines, you could write it in one line. And these, learning, these flow controls such as while loops, for loops, um, functions, they're ubiquitous in coding. So you'll be able to learn what you learn today and in that module, you're able to be able to apply to not just R, but to Python and you know shell scripts and any other code that you learn in the future or you already know. And one of the biggest things and the best things is that it saves you time. And at the beginning, it might not seem like it saves you time, but once you start writing your own scripts and you start getting you know more confident in your script writing, you will see that it actually saves you a lot of time. So, oh, and just a reminder, if you have any questions, free, feel free to either ask or type it in the, um, in the chat and one of our TAs will try and answer that for you. So, to get started, we're gonna first go over if statements. So, I have, if statements are kind of um, conditions that you write if you, so it's kind of as on the right, you see that if statements are written in the following structure. So pretty much your condition will be whether something is, equal, is true or not. So it could be a numeric condition or a Boolean condition such as X is equal to two and if x is equal to two, if you put that in as your condition, the if statement will run your code. But if it's not, then this if statement will not run your code and you won't get an output. So most, these, most of these if statements and for, for, loop, um, for loops and while loops have this sort of um, structure of you put your condition in between parentheses and your code will be in between two brackets, as you see right here and right here. So that's kind of the structure that most of our, um, our statements are gonna follow. So to look at a couple examples of if statements, so they could take the following forms as again, being either numeric or logical. Looking at a logical um, example, we could set X as our condition being x being greater than zero. And I'm gonna write, so I'm gonna say x is equal to the number 42. But, and then I'm gonna write an if statement that says, and it reads as this, if x, so your variable is greater than zero, here's my code, I'm gonna print 
positive number. So again, the, your code goes in between the two brackets. And when you actually run this in R, so first defining your variable x equals 42, and then running um, your if statement, you end up with x, you end up with um, a printing output of positive number. Now, if that was a different number, such as x is equal to negative three, or anything below zero, you actually wouldn't get an output. And another, looking at the other type, of condition such as a logical condition where x is equal where x is if x is true we could write it like this so x is equal to three again we're going to be using numbers for these um, statements and examples so again i write a new if statement but this time i write if x is equal to three so as you notice there's a um there's a when I'm setting a variable to a, numer a number or integer, I have x just equals with one equal sign. But inside your condition, you're going to put two equal signs, as that is a, as we're working with Booleans in this case. So here we say x is equal to three, and if that x is equal to three, and that's true, then we're printing x is equal to three. So again, this is very simple, but it's more just to get the point across. So, and since x is equal to 3, it'll print x is equal to 3, because the your condition evaluated as true. So you end up printing and um, running your code, executing your code. So moving on, there's another thing you could add to your if statements, which are called else statements so together if else statements so these are kind of optional for if statements and it kind of gives you another option because you don't always just want to if your code if your condition equals false or evaluates to false you don't always just want it to not run anything sometimes you want it to run something else so that's what we use the if the else statement for so here we would read it as if your condition equals to true or evaluates to true, you run your first line of code within the first brackets. But if it's not, if it doesn't evaluate to true, we now say else, we run, we now, if it evaluates to false, we now run the code that's within the else bracket. So right here. And again, we still use the code goes in between your brackets. And for these if else statements, it's important to know that your else statement, your else right here, should go right after the end of your bracket for your first if statement to make sure R recognizes that they're part of the same um, statement. So looking at some examples, let's say again, we're looking at a numerical condition of x is greater than zero. So again, looking x is equal to 42. But this time, I appended my if statement. So again, it reads, if x is greater than zero, print positive number. But else, if it evaluates to false, if my condition statement evaluates to false, it's going to print negative number. So as you see here, since it's still x is equal to 42, it's going to still print positive number. But if I had changed it to negative 3 or any other negative 0, instead of printing positive numbers, going to skip that and go to your else statement and print your code there and run execute your code in your else brackets. And again, looking at the example of logical condition uh, where x is e evaluates as true, again, using the same number, x is equal to 42. And this time I'm writing if x equals to three, print x is equal to three. Or if it doesn't and your condition statement evaluates the false, print x is not equal to three. So since x is equal to 42, our condition statement evaluates to false. And so it skips our first, first code and this time executes our else statement where it says x does not equal to three. So, that's kind of how the if and else statements work. You write an if statement to a 
evaluate um, whether your condition is true or not, and then you could execute code based on that. Or if it's you want to execute code based on if your condition statement is false, you would add an else statement. So now we're going to move on to loops. So loops are used in programming to repeat a specific block of code. So one general rule that I like to follow when it comes to programming is that you shouldn't try and um, you shouldn't have like the same code more than once fall right after each other. You know, it, it might be easier just to copy and paste at the beginning, but it you're just introducing the chance for more mistakes. And these for loops and while loops um, are able to allow us to, instead of taking up a lot of space, copying and pasting code, we're able to just run it all at once. So we're going to start off with the for loops. So again, these for loops are used to run code over um, many variables or values in a sequence. So one important thing about these for loops is that, as you see here, it's written for variable in sequence, and then you still have your bracket where your code goes into. And it's important to notice that we now have this new variable var. So your sequence is actually could be a vector, a, um, a list, or another type of R object, but your variable is a new, is going to be a new variable that you write in your code bracket. So you're pretty much creating a new variable that's going to be run in your code. So looking at some examples, say we want to print out the elements in the vector numbers that I just created. So I created a vector using um, the cat or com combine command of a vector that's one, two, four, and six. And I want to print out each of these elements in the in the vector by itself. So a way to do about for a for loop, which might seem easier to do at the beginning, is just to put print numbers, so your vector, and then just um, index for the number or the value in your vector. So that's what I do here. So I print it, one, then I just copy and paste, kind of what I said before, where we're copying and pasting and just changing little numbers to get the result we wanted. So I took four lines to get this one result. So one, two, four, six, I'm printing each value in the numbers vector. However, as you see, this does not look good and it'll be pretty easy to make a mistake where you're putting, where you're indexing. So we can use for loops to actually do this in an easier way. So I'm going to use our for loop. So for our variable in numbers, so for each variable in the vector numbers, and then putting my code in our little brackets, I'm printing the variable. So remember, we're creating a new variable from that's in our condition statement. So var and var. This can be any um, name or variable you want. It could be x, it could be y, it could be name, um, but they have to be the same. So var and var, this too has to be the same. So I go ahead and write this for loop. And now when I run it, I get all of our, I'm able to print each value in the numbers vector. So as you see, this could be written in one line. I, um, I, I added tabs just to make it easier to view. But you see, it's a, very, it's a lot easier and a lot cleaner than copying and pasting uh, a single command. So, but there's also another way of using for loops. So the way I showed it before, if you saw, if you looked at the R data count module, this is kind of the um, version one way of doing it. But there's also the second version way, which is a, uh, which utilizes the index of your vector. And this is actually a very more, a little bit more, well, a bit more powerful way of doing for loops because it gives you more options. So in here, it's kind of, this for loop's gonna do the same, it's gonna give the same output as my previous for loop. 
but this but in this case instead of using um var in just numbers we're going to use var from one dot length numbers so length is a function that takes the how many variables or values are in your vector so here length of numbers would equal to four because we have four different values one two three four in our numbers vector so this would end up telling um your for loop so for var in one two four so it's going to repeat this for loop four times for the number one the number two number three and number four and as you see here now our var is over here now it's actually being used as the index for our numbers vector so what it's going to do is going to do print numbers var or and var is going to replace with one which will print our first um, value and then in the second round when it goes var in um, number two it's going to do print numbers index two so it's going to print number two and then so on it's going to do again print numbers index three and it's going to print the third value in our numbers um, vector and then so on so this is um, a little bit more at least at the beginning it might seem a little bit more advanced but once you get the hang of your for loops this will become a much more powerful way of doing your of utilizing for loops so now that we're going to move on to while loops so while loops are um, a type of loop that is completed and repeated until a specific condition is met and so by that it means it usually will repeat your code as you see here again um, yeah so again your code is inside the brackets and this code will be repeated until your condition evaluates to false so looking at some examples so one thing about while loops is that because they are going to be completed or evaluated until um, your condition is false, there's a chance that they can be repeated infinitely and never end. So that's why when you're doing these while loops, you need to actually append your variable in your code to make sure that eventually your statement is gonna evaluate to false. So we're gonna start with setting x is equal to one. So remember, if you remember from our first, um, workshop you can use either the caret and the dash sign or an equal sign to set a value to a variable so we're writing this while loop so this says while x is less than six we're going to pr um, print the following text so x is equal to x so paste is just a function or a tool that um, combines or concatenates multiple strings into a single string. So this is gonna say x is equal to x. So whatever x is, is gonna print that out. And as you see here, I make sure to append our variable that we created. So just like the for loops, you're still gonna be, um, you still need to append, well, in for loops, you don't need to append your code but in while loops you will because if we don't do this x is always going to be equal to one and if x is always equal to one it's always going to be um, less than six so if it's always less than six the while loops is gonna run 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 and run infinitely but since i added this as you see here i'm pretty much overriding or again writing over my original variable so when this first runs it's going to say um, one plus one equals two and then since I changed it now the x when the for loop runs again now the our x variable is equal to two so it's still two is less than six and now it's going to print as you see here x is equal to two but now again we're changing it again so now it's two plus one which is equal to three and now x is still less than three I mean, three is still less than six. So again, we it 
runs the code by pasting and outputting the string. And eventually it keeps on going until we get to five, where five plus one equals six. So now this condition no longer evaluates the true, evaluates the false since six is not less than six. And that ends, as you see here, that will end your while loop. And yes, so that's one thing about these while loops is that if you don't add this little, if you don't change or edit your original variable, there is a good, it will run forever. Because otherwise it'll just keep on going um, x is equal to one, 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 if we never added this little part of code. So sometimes um, we're gonna, you wanna either skip a certain value in your vector in your list or just um, completely end your um, loop if you reach a certain value. Maybe that value shouldn't be in your list and you don't, and if it is in that list, there's no point in running your code anymore. So R has two different statements to help you with that. They're called break and next statements. And as I said, break statements are used to terminate the loop at a chosen iteration. Um, so again, these are usually used in if statements. So if your condition evaluates to true, it will run your code or it will break. And again, for your next statements, you use it to skip a certain iteration. So if you don't run or run your code on that value in your vector or list, you could use next to actually skip over it. And these if statements are usually run inside. So, you know, it doesn't really make too much sense right now because, you know, your if statement usually only has um, one, you're only usually running on you know, one variable, but you usually actually run these if and break and next statements inside a larger um, for loop. So you nest, so when you have multiple, you know, statements inside one large statement, such as a for loop, and this would be called a nested if loop. So this reads as for, a, so for, again, your variable in your sequence, and the sequence being your vector list, you will then run your code. And if a condition is met, you can either, in this case, break your code, so just completely end it, or you can also change it to run, to just skip over a certain value and continue running. So we're gonna look at certain examples to try and make more sense of this. So again, we're using the same vector that we used before, um, numbers, the numbers vector. But this time, we're gonna use it in a for loop that also has an if loop. I mean, not if loop, an if statement. So this, again, reads for your variable and numbers. So it's gonna run each, um, it's gonna run this for loop for each uh, one of these values in your vector. And this says if variable equals to four, um, you're gonna break your actual code. I mean, you're gonna break the loop because maybe, again, you don't want, the number four shouldn't be there, and there's, so you don't wanna continue running your code. So this says if, you know, your variable is equal to four, which it is in one of these parts, in one of these in index three, it's gonna print the variable four should not be there exiting. And then I put break. So now when the variable is equal to four, you're breaking and exiting the loop. But if it's not, it's just gonna skip over this. Because remember, if your variable in your, if your condition statement in your if loop does not evaluate to true, it just um, skips it and moves on. And in this case, it moves on to the code for your for loop, where it just says value, where it just tells you the value of um, that variable. So this is how it looks. So it would do for number one, it would go for for one, and then it's not one is not equal to four. So it just goes over here and prints values are one. And then same thing for two. 
However, Wait, Paul, see. quick question. Yeah. Um, when you use, say you have um, nested for loops, like you have a loop in a loop, how far up the hierarchy does it break travel? Does it terminate all the loops or does it only terminate the loop that the break statement is in? Um, so it actually, it terminates where you have your, um, so for that, for so for that one loop on your one either like one two four and six it will break that part of the loop and then continue it won't well actually sorry i'm thinking of next for this one it will actually break the whole for loop like you'll break the if and the for so as you see here my output when i run this thing when i run the whole loop once we get to four it breaks and that actually ends your for loop as well. So we didn't get to our number six. Right, but does it travel further up the hierarchy? So say you're iterating over a matrix and you have nested for loops, one for rows and one for columns, and then you have an if statement with a break, it, it terminates both loops that are currently running or just whatever for loop it's in, just the first for loop it finds? Um, I think, let's see. I think it only breaks your the where your it only stays in that hierarchy. It doesn't like travel all the way up. Okay. You know what I mean? It stays right there. Okay, so just otherwise the first loop it finds. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because correct. So yeah. Now we're gonna be looking at the next statement. So just to iterate the difference between break and next. So again. This is kind of the exact same thing as before, except I'm replacing your break statement with your with a next statement. So here, it's gonna again, it's gonna run the, your for loop. So it's gonna run print paste values r for all the numbers or variables in your numbers vector, except it, when variable or your variable equals to four, it's gonna print paste the variable four should not be there, and then next. But yes, so as you see here, it's gonna actually skip. So we have values one, two, value four, and then it skips to number six. So instead of breaking it completely, this would be, you're actually, it might have been better if I had, for this next statement, if I just removed our print paste, because as you see here, um, if I had removed that, we would have just, it would have been values R1, values R2, and values R6. And we wouldn't see the value before should not be there. Because, yeah, that makes it a little bit more, um, yeah, it's a little bit more tricky now, the way I wrote it. But basically, as you see here, it actually, it's still technically skipped over four. But since I had it, since I added this little um, piece of code, it, um, it still ended up printing a value. But if I hadn't actually taken this out, we would only have values are one, values are two, and values are six. So again, for next statements, you usually just use if you wanna just skip over a certain variable that you, or that you can specify in your if um, condition statement. So now we're gonna look at functions. So functions, are you know take an input and produces an output like your basic function, you know kind of like how in the R data camp they say it's a black box. You know, you give it like you give it an input and the black box spits out an output. So functions are going to be very important for your bioinformatic work, as many bioinformatic tools um, produce functions in R to help you in your bioinformatic work. So there's many different types of functions. I'm gonna go over a, a couple of um, basic R functions that already should be installed with um, your basic R um, version. So again, we're using our numbers um, vector. So there's the print was actually a function. So as you see here, we're inputting our vectors and print actually gives us an output of our um, what that vector numbers um, contain, so one, two, four, six. 
but there's other functions as well, such as our um, str function that we learned in our previous class, where you, again, input your vector list, and then it tells you the structure of your um, input. In this case, it's a numeric or vector of one, two, four, six. And then there's other types of vectors that you're probably going to be using, or you probably used in other coding situations, such as sum, which, so this, so sum is kind of what it says. It takes the sum of your vector. And here we get one plus two plus four plus six, which equals 13. And we also have another type of function, such, which is called sample. And sample just randomly takes, um, well, in this case, it randomly samples the values in your vector and gives you an output of that same length. So this vector has four different values and it outputs our values in a different order. So this can, the sample vec, the sample function can actually be used to generate a random list or a random vector of random numbers as well. So we're gonna, one really important um, function that we need to learn today are the read and write functions. So this is gonna be very important for actually um, importing your own data into R. So you, such as, and by data, this is usually gonna be like, perhaps like a, an Excel table or a, in this case, we're looking at comma separated um, tables. So they, these are actually sep, all the data points are separated by commas. So these um, data, so this, these two functions take the following form. So with read.csv usually just put um, so this will read the file called bioinformatics.csv into R, and you could also um, assign it, so assign your new table to an object. In this case, it's gonna, I have an object called data underscore table. And these, um, usually these will end up being read as data frames, depending on them. And so, one thing that's important here is right here, I just put bioinformatics.cv, so the name of your file. So this could have like RNA-seq data or other types of data that's in a kind of a table-like format. But this is assuming that where you're running R, your, ac your actual file is in that same directory. So if you have your bioinformatics.csv file in a different folder, such as if you're in the folder called um, bioinformatics workshop, but your actual folder that you want to add, uh, analyze is in a different um, folder, such as, um, you know, lab work, you would actually need to put the full path or, uh, yeah, it's usually safer just to put the full path for right now. So actually telling R exactly where in your computer your um, file of interest is located. And then, so, we learn what the read.csv does. So the other part, write.csv, is what we use. So after we've done all our analysis and we now have like a nice little output to show our bosses, we will want to, um, you know, we want we don't want to show it, show them the data in R. We usually want want to show it to them either in a, a CSV file or in an, you know, an Excel file. So the way these write.csv functions work is we actually take our data frame, our object that we wanna save, save to our computer. And in this case, it would be data dot table, data underscore table. And here you would just put the name in parentheses of what you want your new um, CSV file to be. So again, this, if you don't want it, if you want it in a certain folder, you can put the full path. So such as um, home, you know, home, your name, whatever, whatever, um, bioinformatics workshop or whatever, whatever work, um, lab work. And that's kind of how you read and write files for R. You could also, there's also different ways of, or different formats you can read and write into 
um, are, such as um, text files, so .txt, and um, .tsv files, so .tsv. And you could also even, there's some functions that allow you to read in actual Excel files, though those can be a little bit more um, tricky to use due to um, how, um, depending on how your Excel file is structured. So it's usually safer just to use CSV or TXT files. So now um, that we know what functions are and we actually see that we use functions a lot in R and a lot of you've already used functions just doing data camp, we're gonna see how do we make our own functions and why. So the reason why we wanna make functions is that it helps make your code more clear and general functions. So once you write a function, it's a lot easier to maintain than copying and pasting specific code from a old script. And another thing is that you can assign these functions to a variable and now you have like, that's how you will create your own function and actually be able to call it. So these function um, have the following structure. So again, you could name it a variable. It could be any name you want that's not already um, used by R or by a different, um, preferably not by, not used by R and not used by a different um, tool or package. So it starts off with function of X. So X is gonna be your variable that you're actually gonna, you know, your input. And then again, as you see, we start using those same brackets, those two brackets that you'll then put your code in. So I put code.x because you're gonna need to put whatever you describe as your input, whether that be x, y, or an actual name, you know, like variable or something, it's gonna need to be inside your code, kind of just like your um, for loops and, and your if statements. So an example of a function, I created this function called square it. So it does what the name implies. It takes a value of your input. In this case, it's gonna be function x. So your input's x and it gives you the square of it. So y is equal to the x squared. And then it prints um, the square of x. So your function is y. So, and then, so you end up with this. So let's say, so first you're gonna to wanna to run it, so that way it's in your R environment. If you don't run it and you just type in square it, um, parentheses five, you're gonna, it's gonna say, it's gonna give you an error because you actually haven't um, put it in your environment. So you would run it first and then you're gonna be able to um, put any number, in this case it's a number, but yeah you'll put it into your parentheses and it'll give an output the square of five is 25. And you know, and another number, just to give you more examples of using this function called square it, put in the square it of 42, it tells you the square of 42 is 1,764. So there's also, as if you guys did the, for everyone that looked at the R data camp, they also did showed you another type of function called return. So as you see here, it's the same function as before, except this time I added return y. So sometimes you're gonna wanna return certain numbers that depending on how big your function is, it might, R, um, the R function might not automatically return it. So in this case, you would use return y. So as you see now that I tell it to return y actually gives me the new, um, the numeric value. So square root, square it of five, it does what it did before, the square of five is 25, while also returning your new value that you defined inside your function, which is 25. And again, square of 42 is 1,764, while again, looking 1,764 being returned. So now we're gonna look at apply functions. So these are a, sort of a special type of function that um, allows you to repetitively apply a function as you see here. So it's like function within a function 
to a vector or a list and to each of its members. So this will basically, what it does is it applies this function to your values in your list or your vector x. And one important thing about L apply is that it always returns a list. So that's why it has L in front of it. And it's very much similar to a for loop. And one thing about this is it can be done in really just one little line of code. So looking at some examples, I went ahead and created a list here. So using sample function that we talked about before, I say, give me a random set of 10 numbers from one to 100. So one to 100 is your range of numbers you would like to sample from and size is how many numbers you would like. So this does it, so I did it three times X, Y, and Z and I created a list from that. So I did that so now we can, now we have a list and now we're gonna use LPI to find out, to actually tell us what is the minimum value of each number or each value. Um, in your list. So as you see here, we're using L apply. So min is going to be done on list. So on your list value. So, and we're going to assign it to the list underscore min object. So we can do this. Multi so after doing that, it actually tells you print and we print the actual um, value now or the, our result object. It printed the minimum values for each of these um, um, components of your list. So X, actually, the lowest number was three. For Y, the lowest number or the minimum was true, 12. And for Z, the lowest or minimum number was two. And again, as you see here, as we use the str function to find out the actual structure, it's still a list. So L apply. So in conclusion, LPI just applies a function to your list or your vector and outputs a list. And there's a sister function called SApply. So this is, it gives you a simplified output version of LPI. And rather than trying, rather than just giving you a list, it will actually try and simplify it to an array-like object. But the only thing about this is it can lead to confusion if you're not paying attention to your input list and if it's not in the right format. So, but it's pretty much run the same way. You know, using the same list that we created before, we can apply S apply to um, lists and again, using the minimum function. And this time it will tell us again, as you see here, now it's no longer in list form, it's in vector form or an array. And when I look at the structure, I get the structure of this um, our list min um, object, we now have an integer vector of 3, 12, and 2. So as you see, the values are still the same, but now we get a different sort of object. Instead of list, we get an array or a vector. So that's pretty much it for today's um, lesson on intermediate R. So Next week, just a reminder. So next week, um, Vicki Ehlers will be teaching everyone um, Tidyverse, um, specifically DPLYR and GGPlot2, so plotting. And for that, we just wanted to give you a reminder that for that class, you're gonna need to install DPLYR package and the GGPlot2 package from the CRAN repository. And if you're using, for sure, if you're using um, RStudio, you could just, install both of those packages using the following code to the right, which is install dot packages and then parentheses ggplot2 or in parentheses dplyr. So that's it for today. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we're still going to be here for till 630. So if Henry, if, do, you, do you have anything you would like to say? Yeah, that was great. Um, so at this point, what we're going to do, because we have uh, an activity for the people who have finished the intermediate art course. Now, obviously, if you haven't finished that, 
then you know you can hang around here you can work on it while you're still on this call with us so if you run into issues you can ask us questions um, but if you haven't finished it uh, my recommendation is really just go and do that um, take this time that you would have spent here with us uh, and go do that uh, because that's that's really going to be required for you to be able to do the assignment that we have for you or sorry not the assignment but the uh, the uh, practice problems that we created for you now, as far as the practice problems go, um, I don't know, Paul. Did you wanna? Did you wanna show those? I don't know if you have them open. I can also share my screen and show them. Uh, sure, you might wanna share them. I don't have them open currently. Okay, I'm gonna go and do that here in just a sec. So, um, now these are in the box folder. So there's a file called Week Two Practice Problems. And I think I've got that, whoops. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? I guess so. Um, yeah. Hey Henry, did you say so like if we, if we haven't done the intermediate course on data camp to kind of do that, um, like that probably be a better use of the time, is that what you said? Yeah, that's what I was saying. So if you want to, you can hang around on the call to ask us questions if you run into trouble. Um, but okay. yeah, so, I'm going to show the practice problems that you should do once you're done with that. But yeah, you should really finish that before you try to go on to do these practice problems because they're probably going to be too hard if you haven't finished it. All right, cool. Thanks. Okay, um, so here are the practice problems. So essentially this first problem, and I'm going to, sorry, I have this probably set up in kind of a confusing way here. Um, let me just minimize all this. This is in our studio, so hopefully you've all now had a chance to set up our studio. If you haven't, uh, please go and do that. You're really going to need that if you want to do these practice problems, since as you can see here, I've opened the file week two practice problems .r in our studio. So I'm actually going to show that here. Um, so I've got now, oops, this is just had a bunch of crap open. Um, so I'm over here, I'm in R, and I'm just gonna show you how I did this because I think this can be a little bit confusing at first. So I came over here, uh, I said open file, so or just control O. And because I've got this already on my computer, these week two practice problems, I just click on that and I hit open. It's a .r file. .r files are files that contain R code. So you might've seen .py if you've ever used Python before, it's the same concept. So now I've opened it in our studio. So this is problem one. Problem one requires you to find issues um, in the code and fix them so that the code works. Um, so we can see here, if you're in our studio, it actually gives you a little bit of a hint as to what the problem might be. Um, but you'll be able to uh, correct these yourself. And uh, hopefully by the time you finished intermediate R, these won't be too bad because they'll be somewhat similar to the practice problems you've already used in data camp. Okay, um, and then at the very end, you complete this qubit function um, and then you need to use the function to get the correct output. All right, so the second problem is a bit harder. Um, in this problem, you're going to take this data here. It's uh, a, a vector of students who have numeric grades. And it's a named vector. So if you remember from last time, when you make a named vector, um, you can see here it's not only got the values, but it's also got names associated with each value, right? Um, and then the problem is that these are uh, numeric grades and we want to convert them to letter grades. So, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, you know, if you've got a 90 or higher, that's an A. Um, if you've got an 80 to an 89, that's a B, and so on and so forth. So you need to complete this function, or not function, sorry, you've got to complete this for loop that I've started here. And then this if else statement here, so that um, all of the numeric grades are converted to letter grades. And then you're going to save the letter grades and the numeric grades and the student names in a data frame called student grades. And then you're going to write that data frame to a CSV file. So it's gonna combine pretty much all the skills we've talked about here. And hopefully by the time you're done with intermediate R, uh, this will not be too difficult. Um, 
going forward though, there's now a challenge problem. So if you get to this point, uh, let me or any of the TAs know. We want to know who's able to get to this point. But if you're able to get to this point, please just take at least a shot at the challenge problem. Um, it's going to be very hard if you are uh, if you're really new to R and if you haven't completed intermediate R, it's probably going to be impossible. So make sure you complete intermediate R before you attempt this. But this challenge problem is going to involve you creating a function called gene ID converter. And what it's going to do is it's going to take these gene IDs. Now these are, these are all ensemble gene IDs. And it's, you're going to convert them to gene symbols. So gene symbols, for example, like BRCA2, EZH2, PARC7, you might be more familiar with those because those are how we typically show genes when we're talking about them as scientists. Uh, the gene IDs is how bioinformaticians actually tend to deal with genes because gene IDs are much more stable. Gene symbols actually tend to change a lot over time. Um, so a common task for a bioinformatician is to convert between a gene ID and a gene symbol. And that's what this function is going to do. All right, uh, and then you've got a series of increasingly difficult ver uh, iterations on that challenge problem. So now you've got a super challenge problem where you're going to have to extend your gene ID converter to do increasingly more complex tasks um, to the point where at the very end, it's going to be quite difficult and um, it's going to take a vector of gene IDs and convert them into lists. Um, and you'll see, if you read the instructions, you'll kind of see how that works. Um, hopefully, you guys are able to at least complete the first part of the challenge problem. And as I've said in the requirements, if you, if you actually get to these later points, um, continue to let us know <laughs> because that's, that's uh, quite impressive. Um, and we might want you to help us out with this as a TA next time. So do let us know. Okay, but yeah, that's the challenge problems. That's the practice problems. They're all on Box. So hopefully all of you are, are able to access Box. I, I've sent the link a few times, uh, but they're all there under week two. All right. Um, so that's pretty much all that we have. If you guys um, want to go ahead and attempt these, if you've already completed Intermediate R, do that. If you want to work on Intermediate R, while we're still here, um, and you can ask us questions, do that. We're going to be hanging out for another 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, that's all I have at this point, unless anyone else has anything. I missed the beginning of the, um, the problem section. I had to go help out someone. Um, do we need to submit these in any way, or do we just do these for our own enjoyment? Yeah, actually, if you... It, um, depending on how far you get, how long you want to work on them, um, go ahead and if you can at least complete that first challenge problem, then email any of the TAs, email me or Paul, um, even email Dr. Chen with your, with your code. Okay. And once you, once you do that, we'll, we'll give you access to the solutions. <laughs> so just to add a quick one. So the, just, if you have fun, then the, uh, you may find, try to find solution other than what uh, Henry provides you, it, that would be fun and a challenge to us as well. So uh, anyone has question, they can always ask. You don't really need to um, just having the final solution and giving us. If you feel that you have a difficult, uh, reach out to any of our TAs. Yes, the, the, last, the last challenge problem um, has the title, Give Up Challenge Problem, because that one's definitely the hardest one. Um, right, so at this point, does anybody have any questions uh, that they'd like to ask? Okay, well, we're gonna hang out, at least uh, the TAs and, um, and uh, hopefully Dr. Chen can also hang out. And if you guys run into any issues or have any questions, uh, just feel free to ask and we'll help you out best we can.